Our guest today is Neil Burchill, and along with his partner, Jocelyn Clark, they run a company called Insights Health and Wellness. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I'd like to start with a quote from the paper, because it was much fun, that, um, okay, where is it? That we both see Fredericton as the capital city of the sickest province in Canada, mm -hmm. and you're meaning um, physical well-being, well yeah. obesity rates and yeah. such. Yeah. And we are continuing to address that in the same way and expecting different results. And it's the definition of insanity. What I liked was this. They believe the key to change is education combined with empathy, motivation, and inspiration. Sounds like one of your vision statements from the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely, it didn't come to us directly because, you know, I've got an extensive background in, in you know, dieting, you, you know, um, weight loss. Um, so it was, it took some work to bring that to the surface. You know, it's the why. It's getting down to why am I doing what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. when I did some, a lot of soul searching in which Jocelyn helped me with, I was able to bring out the, the real meaning, you know, the, the purpose behind, and not just the doing, but the why. And that's, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of that came through with our, uh, our uh, mission statement and our business, you know, uh, portfolio. So to frame this up a little bit for fun, um, so you're running a consulting company in New Brunswick with the intent that you could see there's a huge window for change or improvement. Absolutely. And and um, that speaks to, uh, and I want to get at the age thing a little bit too, mm -hmm. because you've chosen to live here. Right. So one of the themes of the show that continues to surface is that there's an awful lot of people who have chosen to live in New Brunswick because mm -hmm. they see great world of opportunity and for making the province a happier place right. or a better place. Absolutely. And, yep. and those stories don't surface in mainstream media much. No. It's usually about unemployment rates or softwood lumber tariffs and, and the dysfunction as opposed to where we could be going. Absolutely. So share with us some of your perspective on, on where we can be going. As you can tell, I'm excited. But <laughs> the, the, it's, it is all about perspective. I throw the, the uh, word around um, potential quite a bit because potential is energy. And what, we, what we're dealing with right now in, in specifically New Brunswick, in, but in Fredericton where, where I'm working right now, it's an energy issue, right? So uh, it's... No, no right? do it. This yeah. will be fun. Okay. Because um, he's, not, he's not talking NB power. No, no, I'm no. not. No, I'm or talking about talking energy. I'm talking about vibration. I'm talking about health. Mm -hmm. real health mm -hmm. um, so what's happening right now is we're we need to change our perspective and we've got this unlimited potential we have incredible people here we have incredible opportunities but it's the lack of empowerment it's the lack of control that people feel that they have over their own lives that I feel is a big issue here and um, so this is getting right to the to, uh, to the root of it so it's it's education it's it's empowerment it's making daily choices it's combating chronic illness with chronic health hmm. right combating chronic illness with acute health care uh, reactive health care hmm. it's a square peg and round hole mm -hmm. so we have to realize that and that's where that statement came from regarding you know doing the same thing repeatedly is insanity you know if i do something wrong better than you did it's not going to make it right <laughs> Right? Or if I dump more money into something that isn't working, it's not going to make it right. And we as New Brunswickers need to step back and stop looking for change from the top down, but really empower the individuals. So this is, this is the attitude that Joss and I have going into this. In our previous interview a year ago with John McGarry, who was then the CEO of Horizon Health, mm -hmm. um, he, from his perspective, said almost the same thing when I asked him about well, we could reduce health care costs if we simply had healthier people. Right. And he just started to smile because in the frame he has to work and he's sort of, it would sound almost rude for the CEO of Horizon Health to simply say, come on, people, like if you got yourselves in shape, that would be one way of right. reducing health care costs. Here you are saying almost the same thing from your perspective. Right. That um, there's something within all of us that if we could just unlock that. Yes. Um, something really good happens personally and in on a, a larger scale. Absolutely. It's, the human body is designed to be healthy. So if we're not healthy, it's because we've gotten in the way of it. So, you know, um, I often tell people or, or advise people that it's not about getting healthy, it's about being healthy. 
right? And it's the balance of it, and it's just understanding, and it's an individual journey. You can educate and you can give information through group environments because it expedites the learning curve. People learn so much faster in groups and communities, and we see it with mental health today uh, regarding, you know, open discussion, talking about things, and stop keeping things closed in. Mm. So the way that we educate people is uh, it's in groups, and um, these people take the information and they apply it individually, and it's absolutely brilliant. So it's teaching them how to fish. It's giving them information, and mm. instead of dictating health, mm. you know, people are out there right now, and they're fulfilling other people's ideologies of what health should be, and you said it, and it's an unconscious statement, but fit. You know, fitness is not health. Fitness does not make health. Health makes health. Fitness is the cherry on top. Fitness is the ability to endure physical stresses, but it does not create health. Hmm. Pathology still exists. You can run a country mile, but if you have diabetes, cancer, it still exists. It just might take more of it to take you down. Yep. Can you give us a, a for instance, because we've talked in broad strokes, mm -hmm. um, can you give us an example of maybe what one of the sessions would look like and what you touch on or give us a concrete example? Well, what we, what we enter the workforce with right now and the reason why we chose the workforce is because people spend 61% of their lives at work. So you do these sessions at workplaces? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we go in and we ask the employers and uh, the employers in New Brunswick um, are unbelievable. Like, you know, it's, it's this disconnect. It's just a lack of communication. So when we go into the work environment, we uh, create a community atmosphere. So I'll work with up to, right now, up to about 25 people in, in a particular group. Mm -hmm. And there's a curriculum that we follow. So it's like a dance step. So um, there's educational components, teach you about your body and, and how the body interacts with food. So you're marrying the two together. You're not separating them. Thought comes to mind right away. Most people take it as as a f fact they already know their body. Right. So, d do you run into that? Absolutely. Um, the awakening that you thought you knew your body, but maybe you didn't. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a lot like raising children. You think you know <laughs> your children, but they're their own individuals. They're you know they have their own sets of morals. They have their own sets. They they borrow from us. Hmm. But as a parent, we have a tendency to project onto them. You know, we uh, our inadequacies. You know, we overcompensate with them, and we do it unconsciously for ourselves. The relationship with our bodies is broken. We make our bodies do things instead of you know uh, nurturing our bodies and understanding that our bodies have our best interests at heart. Yeah. And the body will do. It's what it's designed to do since the beginning of time is adapt and overcome. Yeah. Why are we not adapting? Why is it in the first you know, uh, first time in recorded history, life expectancy is on the decline. Why is, you know, the baby boomers, why are the baby boomers going to be the longest living, yeah. right? Yeah. That's not a legacy I want to leave to my children. So I had to, I had to dig deep. So I interrupted you a bit. You were just getting on a roll about workplace, yes. um, working in groups, um, so, making people more aware of their bodies. Absolutely. So uh, the idea of getting into work is the information that we share at work. It, it permeates all aspects of the person's life, but also... There's a community and team building at, as atmosphere and aspect to it. It changes the dialogue, um, the conversations within the office space. Mm. So you start to see people as human. So it's not designation or paycheck. It becomes, okay, this is Sally or this is Joe. And Joe and Sally are a lot like me. And, you know, when I'm in a room doing a presentation with, you know, it could be 100 people, and I ask the question, who in here does not have any concerns regarding their health or the health of a loved one, raise your hand. No one raises their hand. Yep. So we are poised right now. We have this battle cry, our health, which is uh, affecting our economy. Um, it, it ties us all together. So if we can unify that and start empowering individuals, then we've got this grassroots movement and all of a sudden, it's it's permeating into every aspect, not just the, the individual, but the employer. Because as the employee becomes more healthy, and in the broad term of health, it's not about fitness, it's not a six pack of abs, yeah. it's you know more energetic at work, more energy. They have more energy than the day can take from them. So every day they've got a surplus, not a deficit. Mm -hmm. And they're missing less days, they're more productive at work. So <laughs> productivity and, and, and uh, you know, um, all of, all things benefit from it. Interesting thought about productivity. It's a, just a fun perspective to flip and look at it from this point of view instead of the other. 
So um, one of New Brunswick's indicators is its productivity levels. It tends to be looked at through a business lens, mm. um, economic lens. Right. Um, how do we squeeze more water out of the, out of the sponge mm -hmm. so we can think we're more productive? And you're coming at it from another direction. Imagine having energy left at the end of the day instead of being exhausted. Exactly. And the root of that is that person's well-being and their health. Absolutely. Long-term you know, uh, expectancy at work. I mean, you have the European countries where there's generations of employees. And people are there for 35 years. And they don't want to leave. They're not always looking for the, the, the next lily pad or the next lawn where the grass is greener. So you have a lot more retention and you know ownership of their. It's a career. It's not just a job. Hmm. So back into one of your sessions again, and you. So is there a specific do you outline? You know, here's food elements. Here's uh, physical activity elements. Here's your emotional well-being elements. Absolutely, yeah, and tie, try to tie it all together. So, the first. 13 or so hours of it and typically we present it in one hour uh, intervals you know and uh, so a lot of it is education so we've got you know graphs and things like this that we do to help explain so th so the visual learners are there yeah. and tie it all together regarding okay this is your digestive system so there's a three-part series talking about you know the upper right down to your bowels um, how that connects to us and our immune system and so that People are seeing that we aren't just what we eat, we are what we use, okay. right? So putting the food in your face is, it's, it's, uh, there was a commercial years ago when I was a kid and his dad and the son in the boat and the son throws the garbage overboard and he asked the dad, dad, where does the garbage go? And the father says, away, that's it, right? Yeah. That's about, that's our education when it comes to what the food is actually doing inside of us, what the body actually needs from the food. And we've got this um, reversed idea when it comes to us and food, is we evolved around the food, not the other way around. The food was here before us, Yep. right? Yep. So this whole control issue is backwards. The cart is continuously being put before the horse, right? So in understanding the food and understanding your body, you can now start to see where it fits because we're all so unique. Eating an apple at a specific time of the day or if you have certain gastrointestinal issues, that apple might be healthy for 95% of the population, but you could be one of the 5% that it's not, but yet you continue to eat an apple. Why? Because you've been told it's healthy, mm. but not educated, not informed, yeah. right? Following that theme about you, you've been told it's healthy because mm, there's enough information out there to last the next 10 decades, I think, for how the past 30 years have generated volumes and volumes of information right. and studies. It's yeah. the application of that information or communal wisdom right. or personal wisdom. Um, so when it gets into being told that this is good for you, uh, that gets into a little bit of the Canada Food Guide Absolutely. exercise. Yeah. Um, and then when you do a bit of homework on the Canada Food Guide, you find out the impact of lobby groups making sure that their food group is somewhere in that network because yeah. it represents a certain revenue stream for them. And as far removed from a person's well-being. Absolutely. So do you find um, you're not working in a vacuum, but do you find you're not working in an environment that's sort of uh, already enriched for you, like you're swimming upstream a lot, ch trying to get people to undo? Without a doubt, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I, uh, I, I, in my head, I use the analogy of, of changing direction in a vehicle when you're going at a very high rate of speed you need to slow down <laughs> or and sometimes you need to stop so a lot of the energy goes into getting people to unlearn you know uh, in order to get people to find out that the world is round you first need to plant that seed of doubt that it may not be flat mm. and it's not my job to tell them it's round it's for them to go out and explore for themselves because that's their individual journey mm. so my job believe it or not is to unlearn and create doubt and to get people to ask better questions and not to give <laughs> answers because people continuously come to me and they say, Neil, what do I need to eat? Um, just do a diet, a meal plan, and that's a huge disservice. And over the last 30 years, this hasn't worked. Yep. So it's time to approach this from another angle. So if we played with that a little bit, um, but I don't want to put you on the spot if, if it's a... Uh because your answers won't be linear. Right. You've already mapped that out. Yeah. It's not if this, then that. Right. No. <laughs> right. Not with so human I'm, beings. I'm thinking, how do we give an example of what you've just described as 
I'm getting people to unlearn right. or slowing down or you got to come to a bit of a stop and all that energy it takes to come to stop because exactly. it takes an awful lot of energy to break. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then to turn it around. So, so do you have a, a for instance, of um, a, a nameless person where mm -hmm. they had gotten this far, they thought this was right, this was true, this was accurate, and then er, it stops. Oh. And it's like, oh goodness, it's actually this way, not that way. I'd say close to 98% of the people that I, that I come in contact with have these preconceived ideologies based on information that was, you know, fed to them um, regarding, you know, protein usage, you know, uh, carbohydrate, you know. So do it for instance. Um, well, there was a, a person that I worked with who was a very fit individual and because of the chronic or sorry the acute nature of their of their fitness they were they they used it to manage their weight and they thought in terms of uh, macros you know proteins fats and carbohydrates the big picture and they were missing the tiny little details the screws the bolts the the, the things that keep us together the stuff that matters once we're developed as we become adults the big nutrients you know we're not building a house anymore the house is built now <laughs> okay. it's about maintaining the house okay so the big the lumber and the, the the machinery and all the everything isn't needed anymore it's about having a well-equipped toolbox so that would be what you just said the proteins the fats and carbohydrates okay. the big so nutrients. at a certain point you don't need the big tools or the big lumber not the focus on it Okay. Um, the focus needs to be on the the micro the, the vitamins and minerals the living aspect the energy within the food not the fuel okay so this person was weighing and measuring and having all of their meals prepped and set up for the week and it was causing a lot of discourse in the family mm -hmm. because she would be invited to a place you know for social engagement and she would bring her own food and you know that type of behavior like uber um, hyper vigilant yeah, hyper vigilant exactly so you know um, Eventually what happens is the body feels strangled and cortisol levels, adrenaline, all this stuff. It, it envisions starvation. Since the dawn of humanity, starvation has been the number one cause of mortality, right? And the body knows it on a genetic, you know, biochemical level. So the minute that the body feels deprived, not calorically, but nutritionally, it starts to combat the process. And all of a sudden, you know, people plateau, this, these things don't work. So they have to push further, and in that pushing further, you're 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 forcing the body into a situation that it sees as dangerous, and in its efforts to protect you, it wants to go back to familiar, not necessarily comfortable, but familiar. Yep. Oh, so yeah. she had gotten to a point where psychologically, physiologically, sociologically, she was starting to just fall apart. Hmm. Right. Her facade of control was starting to break. So, and it's funny when we came in here, you know, the, the uh, um, wall hanging they have over there regarding letting go. Yeah. Right? And it, what entailed there was just convincing this, this healthy young lady that she needed to let go and listen to her body and let the body guide. Right? Give the body what it needs. And the more that we can quiet our surroundings and stop looking to control, hmm. then all of a sudden we get more intuitive when it comes to our, our food. And... You know, the father of medicine, uh, Hippocrates, said that disease can't exist where there's health, right? Disease only exists in the absence of health. So with some work, I convinced her to, um, to do it for health, not for fitness, right? To let go and get to know her food, get to know her body and eat for health. And all of a sudden, the stress levels dropped, her body fat percentages dropped. She enjoyed exercising because she wanted to, not because she felt the need to. And she had more energy for her family. She became a lot more balanced and was able to go out and uh, eat socially and you know, have a, have a glass of wine, mm -hmm. which really helped the relationship with her husband. And the inflammation, the joint pain, the sleeping issues, the anxiety issues, all of those things started to dissipate. And the difference was more than just a perception. So in a concrete world or in her scheduling of her food world, right. um, you helped her focus more on? Plants. Okay. Yeah, plants. Right? <laughs> we, again, have this misnomer that we are hunter-gatherers. Hmm. We're gatherer-hunters, hmm. right? And that's, that's the big aspect of it. So it's not, I live in a very gray world. 
not black and white, okay? Um, the reason I, I say that is because you will see me at a Royals game eating a hot dog. Yeah. And people have approached me, you shouldn't be eating a hot dog, it's unhealthy. <laughs> And really, but a hot, it tastes good. It, it tastes <laughs> good, and you know, I'm there with my son, and it might be one of three games that I see that entire season. Yeah. So believe it or not, the hot dog could be the healthiest thing I'm putting in my body, because of the psychological impact, yep. right? And the hot dog isn't going to hurt me unless I choke on it. It's how many hot dogs I eat. Yep. It's what I eat in between the hot dogs. So it's this balance of all things. And moderation is right now one of the dirtiest words in the English language. Yeah. Right? We don't understand it. It intimidates us. We want parameters. This is excellent because you're offering up a nuance and subtlety into something that most people think they already know. Right. They already feel that they're well informed about what I need to eat in order to be healthy. Yeah. And, and most people, in the sense that we get so much information pushed at us, school systems, television. We're inundated um, with it. Yeah. And that's almost a counterbalance the way uh, television commercials now are so... If you watch any of the food commercials that are up there, it's none of it's really good for you. So there's that challenge, too, of discerning that what television is pushing at you for your food choices, mm -hmm. um, which is geared to profit margins, right. um, is very different from trying to start this conversation and yeah. this narrative about it's even more nuanced than the Canada Food Guide. Absolutely. It's, it's more nuanced right to who you are. And, and I'd like you to explore a little bit something you teased a bit and then went into some concrete stuff. It was about, um, if you listen to your body, you'll, your body will tell you yes. what, what to eat. Can yeah. you wander into that a bit? We see it in pregnancy all the time. I mean, you could, you know, a pregnant woman can walk by an aisle of fruit and <laughs> walk by watermelon, you know, 99 out of 100 times, but then that one time, they just can't walk by it. They have this insatiable craving for it. And that's, a lot of that is, is, it's intuitive. The body knows through perception, color, smell, all of these things that, you know, we've done for generations. There's an intuition and the body associates the vitamin or mineral or whatever that has with that particular food. The brain messes it up. You know, if, <laughs> if a woman, if, if a female, uh, a, a pregnant woman uh, craves pickles and ice cream, really, when you internalize that, there's nutrients within the pickles and the ice cream that the body's looking for. But why is it pickles and ice cream? If you never had pickles and ice cream, how would you ever crave it? So it's lost in translation. And people have, again, been misled. True starvation is at the cellular level, and it's a nutrient deprivation. If I went into the woods uh, with a 600-pound individual and you came back in you know, uh, six to eight weeks, gave us all the water we could drink, the two of us would be dead of starvation. How is that possible with all of those calories? So calories are really useless to the body. It's a unit of heat. That's it. It's not a nutrient component. So the more nutrients, the more uh, aware we become of our bodies, then the body's demand becomes uncluttered. And the mind, the Rolodex in the mind starts to play nice and it's not getting lost in translation. The two of them are working together. And I found this myself in, you know, my issues coming up with, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, bulimia, with uh, exercise-induced bulimia and being, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, being morbidly obese or being obese uh, growing up. I've had the unique perspective on both sides, but it wasn't until I started listening to my body. And I'm 43 years of age, and I started this journey when I was 13. So it's been 30 years of therapy, you know, <laughs> trying to, you know... Um, and then going into bodybuilding and all this and trying to control all the elements. But yeah. there is an intuitive factor that we need to strengthen. And the only way that we can do that is by, you know, letting go and, you know, getting information and applying the information and being wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, but in that being wrong, you're one step closer to being right. It's, you know, it's evolution. It's, it's self-actualizing, uh, yeah. actualization. Um. So here we start the conversation talking about nutrition and food and how easily it slides to intuition. Absolutely. And, and knowing uh, the body's awareness of itself. Right. And letting your big brain get out of the way. Right. <laughs> Let your body tell you. Um, do you have any, for those that are watching, do you have any kind of a little, a little test or a little example or a little um, cue for somebody? If they're sitting there thinking, gee, how do I do that? You know, is it smell? Is it sight? Is it listening to your body from a different place? It's 
stepping back and looking at the broad perspective like it, constantly people are are always looking for the little tricks the little catches and it's to the point honestly if i'm going to be totally frank it's up for you to find that like you know for me to give that type of information to tell you how to do something hmm. is again a disservice okay right i like just the fact that See, my information is experiential. Like it's, I've been involved in this heavily for the last, at least, at the very least, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's imparting information. And then, did you ever, you know, hear something that just clicks with you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the intuition right there. It's, it's not the food. The food comes after. The intuition is the, it's listening. And, and why is it that something sticks in your head yeah. and not in mine in a conversation or for walking down a a street yeah. and you see a beautiful flower and I'm totally, you know, it's a, right? Yeah, resonance. Exactly. The, uh, because your story of uh, the pregnant woman or the watermelon in mm -hmm. the grocery store story, um, be interesting exercise to walk people through the grocery store right? and j tell them not to see with their eyes or don't watch with, don't see with your eyes and try to see with your nose maybe right. or this other or a energy field around you picking up something. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. And it, because it, of information, you know, people are afraid. Well, Neil, you know, I'm really craving bananas. Or a woman's going through her menstrual cycle and she's craving chocolate. Hmm. What's, where, you know, where is that coming from? What's the issue with that? And we're made to feel guilty. Well, if I, if I eat too many bananas, then I'm going to be unhealthy and diabetic. And you know, but we're, we're <laughs> so inundated with information. It's um, in the fire department, we used to call it paralysis by analysis, <laughs> right? You, you can't think for too long because stuff is happening. Yes. And if you're stationary, the stuff happens and you fall behind because you're not making any, okay. any headway. So um, it's just getting people to a point that uh, they're tuning out a lot of the information, right? They're, they're tuning out a lot of what they're being told and just kind of... Um, allowing it to permeate naturally. So, the, you know, I in, in one hour I can deliver a lot of information. And it's amazing, after the classes are over, if you bump into someone in an elevator, what they take from it, I'm always astonished. I, I don't even remember saying that, yeah. you know? Yeah. Meanwhile, it, it was a defining moment for this person. And someone else gravitates and holds something else. So the information, I think, is really, really important. And right now, there, there's information, but it's all agenda-based, like you had mentioned before. Hmm. I watched, over the last three weeks, three documentaries, just, again, to see what people are, are privy to, what they're, what, yeah. what's, what's happening. I watched a documentary on how wheat will kill you. Mm -hmm. I watched a documentary on how sugar will kill you. Mm -hmm. And I watched a documentary on how meat will kill you. Mm -hmm. And this is what the everyday person is watching on Netflix without the information to be able to look at that and say, okay, I, I need to take... I, I need to hear what they're saying, but not listen to it verbatim. Yeah. Um, forks over knives. Yes. Have you watched that yeah. one? Yeah, that's um, a good one. Did you have a do you have a sense of it? I do, and <clears throat> uh, you know, again, <clears throat> I look at the general context. I don't look at you know, right? I do eat animal products, but mm. I eat them responsibly in accordance to what my body needs based on what I do, and who I am. Yeah. Um, so that you know there's a lot of information that we can take from all of these documentaries and you know everything that any everybody's saying but we have to step back with that information and determine whether or not just it's pertinent for you and the only way that you can do that is by experiencing and putting in practice that information i went vegetarian or vegan for almost two years and it was good at first but it wasn't allowing me to do the things that i really enjoy doing i love working out i love lifting weights and i found that it just it affected me in that regard but it cleared up a lot of other things so how can i tailor it this hybridized version that fits me specifically mm -hmm. and what happens is when someone has uh, has these epiphanies all of a sudden they become a zealot <laughs> you know, you need to do this. Gluten yeah. is killing everybody. You need to get gluten yeah. out of your diet. And yeah. really, that's not the issue. When you, in, in my opinion, when you look at all of the research that's done with wheat and, and animal product and uh, sugar-based things, and then you look at the, the communities, countries, uh, cultures that are incredibly healthy, and they smoke and they drink, and right? <laughs> 
Um, and they live, you know, very long life expectancies, virtually free of chronic illness and disease. Seven out of ten people right now that are hospitalized in New Brunswick are there for things that they can prevent. Yes. Right? And it's caught. Yeah. So they don't know the micro and macronutrients of their foods, right? They just know that this food is good for them. It's local. It's unprocessed. That, in my belief, is the key. The less labeling that you can get on your food, the better that that food is for you, and the body will sort it out. If you were to put a salad in front of yourself and myself, exact same salad, and we ate that salad, you would absorb something different than I would absorb. If you put a loaf of bread in front of you and a loaf of bread in front of me, we both absorb the same thing. And those, those nutrients can be stored for later. Whereas when you're getting into more water-soluble nutrients, the body uses what it needs at that particular moment and gets rid of the rest. Right? So it knows. It's, it's, you're being intuitive without actually having to weigh and measure and do all of that, you know, incredibly complex things that we have to all of a sudden add into our incredibly complex, overburdened lives. When you go through a grocery store, right? <laughs> what's it like? Because um, when I did the food thing earlier about walking past the watermelon, mm -hmm. following your riff about that, uh, sometimes when you watch um, animals in the wild, so documentaries about animals in the wild, they know what they want to eat right. and they know where to go find it. So the forest or the jungle is their grocery store. Right. And they know what their body wants and they go find it and they eat it and they have a degree of health. Exactly. So through that, um, we human animals go to grocery stores that are packed with products that are mainly processed and a ton of um, promotion Absolutely. coming at you. So. When you walk in there, there's a whap of energy. The second you walk in, yeah. well, I've got to break. Never mind that it's summertime now and it's usually really cold in there, so you mm -hmm. need your sweater when right. you come in the yeah. store. Yeah. It's a whole other story. So what's it like for you when you go in a grocery store? For me, it's, it's fun. It's relaxing because I know what I want. It's very much, and it, it sounds ridiculous to say it, but it's so brutally honest. If you and I lived in a village, and we were tasked with providing the village with the food for this particular week. And we had no idea what we were doing. And we went out and we grabbed the berries that looked the best and the mushrooms that were closest to the village because we were, you know, we were lazy and it was convenient and brought back this big basket of all kinds of different things that we you know, foraged from the, uh, from the forest. And we poisoned the entire village because we don't know what we're doing. How many people do you know <laughs> walk into a grocery store knowing what it is that they're doing, hmm. right? We have, in the truest sense, become consumers. We rely on information fed to us with a health check symbol or a heart smart and, you know, disease is running rampant. Everything is elevating according to the New Brunswick Health Council report. It's deplorable and it's going to get worse. Why? Because we're listening to information that is not for us and it's agenda-based information mm. instead of going. So when I walk into a grocery store, it's, I walk in there very frequently. I don't buy my groceries once a week or once every two weeks. I love going in because then it becomes more intuitive. What do I feel like today? Instead of planning my week, right, my body's demands change from day to day. Mm -hmm. How did I sleep last night? What kind of activity did I have today? What kind of stress am I dealing with? Am I fighting a, you know, a, a cold, a, a virus, or a bacteria of some sort? So, you know, that all comes into play. Yep. Our inability to adapt and change is what's destroying us. That's that's our weakness. Is we can't internalize the pressure. Like when you're in an airplane and you're flying, and the higher you go they have to equalize the cabin pressure or else it becomes inhospitable, right? We've lost the ability to equalize our internal pressure. So we look at life as crushing us. There's too much going on. Mm -hmm. And we externalize that stress instead of internalizing the stress and saying, you know what, we, I, I wasn't always like this. Through evolution, I've survived lions and tigers and bears, oh my, tectonic plate movement, yeah. volcanoes, <laughs> right? Yep. And now some stress is going to bring me down, mm -hmm. right? So I just am ill-equipped. And who's going to teach me this? Is it my 43-year-old brain that believes the world is flat, the sun revolves around the earth, and all of that nonsense? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be my intuitive body in which I use 100% of it and feeding your microbiome in your gut and all the signaling that happens? It's ancient. 
right? We need to start listening to this. That phrase, listen to your gut, yep. it just, it's like, you know, yelling it in a forest these days. People don't understand the gravity of that and the empowerment behind it. Esquire magazine about 10 or 15 years ago um, did a feature like they'll do from time to time, they'll hire four or five writers, give them budget, let them go research for three or four months, right. put together a special issue. Mm -hmm. um, this one was all about your body. And uh, somewhere in the back, it's photocopied. And, and there was a whole section on the gut mm -hmm. uh, as the emotional center right. of the human. Um, do you want to go explore the gut? Because that's something that doesn't get talked about much. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So you, when we say listen to your gut, there's an awful lot to that phrase that needs to be teased out. Yeah, it's a huge, it's, it's a huge part of who we are. Um, you're on a cellular level, like just looking at the body itself. Um, the epithelial layer, the, the layer that c comprises the gut, the football field length of small and large intestine, it can cover your body three times. There's that much cellular activity going on in it. There's more neurons active in your gut than there is in the brain. Everything is alive, it's moving, and it is the gatekeeper. It allows the nutrients from the food to get into your bloodstream and then eventually get to the cells. So if that massive organ becomes inflamed or unhappy or unhealthy, then that sends the entire system in disarray, right? Now you have what's called your microbiome, okay, your bacteria and microbes that live in your gut. They're given to you through the birth canal. So when they do C-sections now, they swab the baby with the mucus from the cervix to you know, uh, elicit this immune response and regulate the immune system and the overall health and development of the baby. But that is one of the most ancient parts of us. That microbiome from the mother was given to the mother from her mother and so on and so on and so on and so on. So that is intuition. It's generations, it's millennia of information that's stored in our gut right but people don't think of it right what are you putting in your gut and the biggest aspect to this Dennis is fruit okay we should be focusing on fiber and in specifically insoluble fiber okay soluble fiber goes through your gut and cleans out your bowels and pulls a lot of the toxic chemicals in, out so you're you know at a lower risk of uh, colorectal cancer prostate cancers and certain hormonal based cancers but the fiber that you get in fruit and vegetables, the insoluble fiber, gets into the gut and converts into a short chain fatty acid that actually feeds your healthy bacteria and allows the healthy bacteria, your natural flora, to procreate, right? So antibiotics, stress, environmental factor, factors, they end up killing the bacteria inside your gut and then causes inflammation and then eventually the walls of the gut start to break down and these little villi, these tentacles that absorb all the nutrients start to break down as well and you create gaps within them and the nutrients, or not the nutrients, I'm sorry, but the food particles start to penetrate and get into the bloodstream and then the immune system has to come in and attack those things. It's a train wreck right now how disconnected we've become with our food and our guts. So in eating more fruits and vegetables, what's happening is, is you're feeding your natural gut uh, uh, bacteria balance and yours. So taking, you know, bifidus, lactobaculus, acidophilus, all these other bacterias, we're taking foreign bacterias, which is better than not having any, but it's still not yours, right? And it creates a dependency and, right, we're outsourcing again our health when really the body knows and can do anything to get healthy again if we're able to give it the tools necessary so eating more fruits and vegetables there's you know numerous other effects that it has throughout the entire body even at the cellular level but even that alone right now i mean in new brunswick we're one of the highest for autoimmune diseases you know crohn's colitis diverticulitis all these types of things um uh, inf uh, arthritis Right, and so if we can regulate our our gut, then all of a sudden everything inflammation starts to subside. Stress, right? Does the stress stop? No, we become more uh, acclimated to it. We become uh, able to handle it. Hmm. And the example I use for that is you walk out your door, and uh, you're hungover. Your day's not going to be very good. 
is the day changed? No. Like, are people treating you differently? No. But your perception of the day changes. And when you think about the size of that organ and the fact that it's inflamed and the fact that it's deteriorating faster than you're aging, so you're aging prematurely in the inside, hmm. you can only imagine the energy that your body's expending trying to keep that organ together. Energy that you could be using for your career, your passion, your children, your family, you know, your spouse. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Fascinating. Um, that was a wonderful journey into the gut. <laughs> yeah. but, right. but it's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could almost redo a graphic in New Brunswick and uh, having a healthy gut. Absolutely. And how from that healthy gut in this province, everything starts to unfold in a much more beautiful way. Actually. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got so much accessibility to food. We've got, we, we have everything at our fingertips, but we're just overwhelmed with um, focusing on issues. You know, when I work with people, I don't care about your cancer. I care about you. Hmm. I want to feed you. And like, Hippocrates said, and you know, scientifically, two objects cannot occupy the same space. Yeah. Why is it? And this is this is an issue with me. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Say we had a schoolyard, and there were a hundred children in the schoolyard. Yeah. And I teach a lot with analogies because of the fact that, you know, spewing a bunch of technological jargon to people, you know, for my own ego is not is not teaching, yep. right? Yep. So it's finding things that people can relate to and using those, you know, metaphors and analogies to help people understand the situation. So you have a schoolyard full of 100 people, 100 children. You've got one bully. By focusing on that one bully, what you're doing is you're allowing the bully to run the schoolyard. It's, you know, the kids walk around the bully. They don't talk to the bully, the bully, the bully, the bully. And the bully becomes bigger and stronger. And we see this in a lot in our lives and in our, our uh, health and human physiology. So by empowering, and they used to do this in the military, they'd have forces sneak behind enemy lines and teach the farmers and the, the townspeople how to fight. So not only were they getting, you know, were the forces that were trying to overtake, they get attacked from the front, but they'd also get taken from behind as well. So. What I like to do, and what I can understand, is how a cancer cell is allowed to mutate, okay, which it does. It, uh, a mutated cell uh, uh, gets to a, a point of angiogenesis with a capillary form, and it starts feeding itself, and then we feed it, and it's fed through sugar, right? Sugar feeds these cells, and these cells become uh, bigger and badder and stronger, and then they metastasize. How can one cell dominate a system of trillions, right? It, it, it just, it bothers me. And why is it that people aren't looking at health in the same context as disease? If you're diagnosed with something, you go back a year later, that diagnosis is either better or worse. It's never the same. So it's all progressive. Health is no different, no different than disease. It's the opposite side of the coin, your health is continual. Your health is progressive. So by teaching people how to take care of their other trillion healthy cells, all of a sudden the bully loses their, their, their inertia, their, their, their leverage, mm -hmm. right? So I really think that we're looking at this from the wrong angle and that's acute health care. That's what they're designed to do. Your chart, you've got a list of everything, your, you know, your ailments, the medications you're on, all this stuff which I think is absolutely brilliant for acute circumstances, but not for chronic issues. And by empowering people and getting them to make good daily choices, 365 days a year, not perfect, but better, all of a sudden their health becomes progressive. Mm -hmm. And myself, I, this is a 30 year experience for me. I feel better at 43 than I did at 33, than I did at 23, than I did at 13. Mm -hmm. There's cultures out there, Dennis, where their blood pressure a 68-year-old man has a lower blood pressure than an 18-year-old boy because the body, how it adapts, it should become more efficient, not less efficient. So obviously something's, something's going wrong, right? We're not, we're not becoming stronger. We're actually, we're born with an A+. Plus. Yep. And by the time we grade, we've got a D- minus because we've basically just, right, 
used it up. Used it up. In, instead of uh, the purpose, because we started this conversation talking about energy. Mm -hmm. And now we've talked about several different manifestations of energy, right. which is fun. So well, we have about five minutes left. It'd be kind of fitting the slide back to energy. Because energy wants to flow. Absolutely. And what you just described was a form of energy that flows. You don't start with an A plus and work your way to a D minus. Right. You actually, what would the analogy be? You actually start with an A plus and you want to stay at an you A plus? You want to stay or you, know, you start with an A and you end up with an A plus. Like it's about, it's about management. It's not about uh, reversal. It's not about avoidance. It's understanding that, you know, life is experiential and it's not about good or bad or right or wrong because that's all perspective it's your perspective it's about you know looking at the nucleus the common link in everything that you do and it's you and getting to know you a little better and you know nutrition is just a, it's a gateway for that that's it's just it's an introduction by feeding your body when you look at the energy that your body has and what it generates not creates because energy can either be created or destroyed but what we generate and we keep looking um, I spoke earlier of the macro we look at your muscles we look at your organs but we're not looking at the cells that comprise the muscles and the organs and what do they need we gotta start thinking small yeah. the devil's in the details yeah. and the body knows this so by feeding this body that holds the head right the head can't, what your eyes see, what your ears hear, you can't unsee and unknow. So as we go through life, the head gets heavier, but as the body gets weaker, we have structural, right, discordance. The integrity of this whole structure is, com is compromised. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the head feels heavier because the body's becoming weaker. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be that way. The energy is, is generated from the cell, the mitochondria in the cell. We start feeding the cells and it's like tuning up your generator right so we're dumping fuel in we're putting the food in <laughs> but the food is not being accurately or or um, uh, proportionally converted or generated into this electrical energy that our bodies need when you go to the hospital hmm. do they test your blood glucose first or do they hook you up to electrodes to make sure your lungs and heart you know cardiovascular pulmonary system is working right we're not looking at the energy we're going in and we're dumping fuel and coffee and all this stuff thinking fuel and it makes about as much sense as your car battery dying so you put another twenty dollars in the tank when going through the grocery store mm -hmm. has it ever crossed your mind that it would be nice if on all that labeling which can be too much information in itself as a whole literacy skill set to yes. read labels now on food that they would have a, a measure in there of energy units and, and like raw energy units as opposed to processed energy units? There's been talk of that, but honestly, I think the magic is in the ingredients list. If people can just look at the list of ingredients and take a look at it, right? Michael Pollan said it best. If my grandmother doesn't recognize it, I don't eat it, <laughs> right? I don't buy my food at a, a gas station. If people just dumbed it down a little bit, it's not as scientific as, you know, not, not to live optimally because there are many cultures still out there that have not had the Western influence and they're healthier. We bring disease and depravity. That's, that's, our, that's our, our, our shtick yep. and it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, we need to lighten things up a little bit. We need to declutter. We need to simplify and be more intuitive and just eat and get to love our food again and get to eat what it is that we have available to us. You mentioned about the animal in the wild we're consumers we have more variety you know it's overwhelming right so you know when you go to these cultural places these different countries you know Chinese people eat Chinese food right what do Canadians eat bacon and maple syrup like we, we because we're so eclectic because we've got so much ethnic diversity and we have so much economy based around you know food coming into our environment and you know, them selling their product and making us see the importance of their product. So we purchase their product. We've lost the fact that, you know, we are creatures of our environment. If we ate more New Brunswick food, you'd find that the chronic illness and disease rate would go down, right? Yeah. And, that's, and that's this whole movement. People often ask, Neil, organic? You know, organic, is that the way to do it? Or all these other selling points that are coming out. And I constantly look them straight in the eyes and say, local, 
local. That's that's we need, uh, you know, in my opinion, and this is just an opinion, <laughs> but we need to remove a Tim Hortons here and there from the eight different places downtown, and maybe put a garden in, so that we're thinking in that regard, so that that garden is feeding the people within that area, right? And like we've got all the technology, we can put a rover on Mars. We should be able to grow vegetables in the winter time, right? So anyway, that's yep. you know that's outside of my wheelhouse per se, but there's a lot of really good people in the community that are experts in that field. So again, it's like working collaboratively, getting the police and fire and emergency services working together would be optimal. You know, getting all of our facets together with nutrition and lifestyle and local uh, um, uh, horticulture and and things like that. Um, I think it's it's brilliant that we're all starting to communicate again. Great place for us to stop. Yeah. Thank you for this. You're welcome. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Um, the Dennis Report counts on your support. So all through this video, you would have seen in the top right corner and a little icon you could click. Support the show through Patreon. Hope you do. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Thank you.